through Ruth here. It should take us about four weeks, maybe just a little more. But Ruth chapter number one. A great book of the Bible, man. This is just, I just, I just love studying the Bible. I'm not getting over it. It seems like it's growing on me. Amen. Thank you, whoever that was. Brother Jim, you study the Bible too, huh? It's growing on me. Amen. Oh, still only Jim. I give everybody a chance. I guess only Jim. If the Bible's growing on me, amen? amen? Hey, there we go. I think you guys are awake. That pizza is so bad for you. But I had a ham. Ooh, one slice of ham pizza. That was good. I tasted the sugar in the sauce. I could taste the sugar. Do you know they put sugar in the sauce to make it addictive? Is that ridiculous or what? I pretty much got sugar almost out of my life. And then, you know, other than fruit, God sugar. And I taste the sugar in it, and it's just, I felt like, oh no, I'm going to have a relapse. It was a whole large pizza, but I didn't. I just had one. Praise the Lord. I had three Oreos last night. Double stuff. So that might be six. I'm not sure how that really plays out. But uh, they were good too. I've been eating that. The only candy we eat is that 60% cocoa from the baking section. You know? That's our chocolate. Because at the end of the day, there's a few pieces of chocolate. And uh, so I had some Oreos last night. They were left over from the Bible study on Friday night. But I, I did not partake of any of the wicked beverage. What did you say? No, 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 not eggnog. Pepsi. We had some Pepsi and some Mountain Dew there that we bought for everybody else. And I did not drink one. I have not had a pop to my, recommend, my recollection since last December. I brought it because I didn't want to drink it. I wanted the temptation out of my house. Amen. I did not drink any Pepsi and I did not drink any Mountain Dew, but I brought it for you. Amen. I was just praying, Lord, you know who needs to be purged from the church to help that person to grab this and drink it. That they might be poisoned. And I'm going to make it all the way to December and then I think I'm going to drink a whole two liter and get sick and vomit and all that kind of stuff. Just have a whole day of like no health food allowed, all candy. And cookies and chips and pop and we'll be violently ill. It might be our New, day, New Year's celebration. You wouldn't do it, sister? Not worth it? You don't think so? Because you think I'll crack and then I'll go all year. Next year, number 13, number rebellion, I'll be like completely off the other end and I'll gain like 50 pounds, right? Like, I were freed from the wall. Pastor's swinging the other way again. <laughs> No, really, it's been good. I've been enjoying it, and I did enjoy the pizza, and I do have liberty to eat it, and so do you. Praise the Lord. But, uh, amen. Well, we had a little food problem today. I think that's why the pizzas wound up down there. So that hasn't happened in, I guess, about six months probably. Five months maybe. Is that pretty safe? So I won't harp on you yet, but I don't know who was slacking today. I know it was a rainy day. I woke up this morning, and it just felt like I got up at five, but I just felt like going back to that bed. Just felt good. About 7:30, I heard that rain outside, and I was just like, like some of you look right now. And I know that happens, but let's make sure next week we knock it out of the park. Amen. All right. Ruth chapter number one. We'll go ahead and get started here. You should have found it by now. <clears throat> Hopefully, I don't have to stall any more than that. Verse number one. Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land. And a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. And the name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi, and the name of his two sons, Malon and Chilion, Ephrathites of Bethlehem, Judah. And they came into the country of Moab and continued there. And Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left and her two sons. And they took them wives of the women of Moab. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other was the other Ruth. And they dwelled there about ten years. And Malon and Chilion died, and also both of them. And the, women was, and the women was left of her two sons and her husband. And then she arose with her daughters-in-law, that she might return from the country of Moab. For she had heard in the country of Moab how that the Lord had visited his people in giving them bread. Wherefore she went forth out of the place where she was, and her two daughter-in-laws, uh, daughters-in-law with her. And they went out on the way to return unto the land of Judah. And Naomi said unto her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each to her mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you as ye have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant you that ye may find rest, each of you, in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them. 
And they lifted up their voice and wept. And they said unto her, Surely we will return with thee unto thy people. And Naomi said, Turn again, my daughters. Why will ye go with me? Are there yet any sons in my womb that they may be your husbands? Turn again, my daughters. Go your way. For I'm too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, I should have, if I should say I have hope, if I should have a husband also tonight, and should also bear sons, would ye tarry for them till they were grown? Would ye stay for them from having husbands? Nay, my daughters, for it grieveth me much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. And they lifted up their voice and wept. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clave unto her. And she said, Behold, thy sister-in-law has gone back unto her people and unto her gods. Return thou after thy sister-in-law. And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee, or to return from following thee, for whither thou goest, I will go. And where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God, my God. Where thou diest, will I die, and there will I be buried. The Lord also do so to me, and more also, if aught but death part me and thee. And when she saw that she was steadfastly minded to go with her, then she left, speaking unto her. So they too went until they came to Bethlehem. And it came to pass when they were come to Bethlehem that all the city was moved about them and said, Is this Naomi? And she said unto them, Call me not Naomi, call me Mara. For the Almighty hath dealt bitterly with me, dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full, and the Lord hath brought me home again empty. Why then call ye me Naomi, seeing the Lord hath testified against me, and the Almighty hath afflicted me? So Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law, with her, which, went, which returned out of the country of Moab, and they came to Bethlehem in the beginning of barley harvest. Let's pray. Father, we love you this afternoon, and I thank you for your people. I thank you for those who... Stuck around this afternoon, Lord, to hear the preaching of the Word of God. I, I know some had to work and some had to go. We pray for those, Lord, who didn't have anything that they absolutely had to do. I pray that you'd convict them and help them to, uh, Lord, stick around for more preaching according to your will. Father, we pray for those that are here that you'd convict their heart, that you'd give them the message here from this verse of Scripture, this chapter of Scripture. Be with my heart, be with my mouth. I pray, Father, that the words of God would go forth now with power and feed your people. I, I ask you, Lord, to be a blessing and to speak to the hearts of those that are here. Convict them as the need may be. Uh, teach and instruct them as they need to learn and grow. And, Lord, I pray you'd rebuke them where the need is and comfort them where the need is. And, God, just do your work in the hearts of each and every person here through the word of God. And, Lord, also for those who may listen by the way of the internet or by the by sermon audio or anything like that. Father, I pray that wherever the Word of God goes, that it would bring forth fruit, that it would be a blessing, that it would be a, a, a correction, instruction in righteousness, good doctrine, whatever it is that the individual needs, I pray the Holy Spirit would deal it out as He sees fit. Help me, Lord. I want to be an able minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and sound doctrine. And I know it rely, rely on this Bible. I know it requires this book. So I ask you to teach it to me and help me, Lord, to expound it according to your will. I pray it all in Jesus Christ's name and for his sake. Amen. Now we're going to begin going through this book of Ruth this afternoon. We should take about a month at it, and that should be it. And I, really, there, really, there's more here than we can even cover in a month. But I'm going to try to just get through the story and just give you a chapter a week to the best of my ability. Interesting thing about Ruth is it's, it's one of two books of the Bible that are named after a woman. Ruth is the only book named after a woman who is a Gentile. This Gentile woman marries a Jew. The picture here in the book of Ruth is a picture of the Gentile bride, you and I, the church, as she is married to the Lord Jesus Christ. And we'll see later the typology of all of that. But that just kind of in a quick nutshell is what the picture is, the picture that the book of Ruth lays out for us. You see... This woman winds up in this position of being married to a Jew because of the spiritually backslidden state of Elimelech and his wife Naomi. There's a Jewish man, Elimelech, and his wife Naomi. They're Jews. And they're backslidden. They're spiritually blinded. They wind up away from God. And as a result of that, this Gentile bride winds up in the body of Christ, married to a Jew. 
You see, the typology here lays right in line with the typology that you and I have as the Gentile church. Since the Jews rejected and crucified the Messiah, we have been grafted in. But let me tell you, the only way to approach that subject is with a humble mind. Look at Romans chapter 11. I'll show you what I'm talking about. Romans chapter number 11. There's these guys going around now teaching this, this uh, we've replaced the Jews and all the promises to the Jews are, are now ours in the body of Christ. And, and that really is a puffed up mind. It's not the Spirit of God and the Bible didn't teach him that. It's a natural man in his natural mind studying the Bible and coming up with common sense conclusions. Did you hear what I said? They'll even show you some wisdom sometimes, but it ain't the wisdom from above. There's more than one kind of wisdom if you study the Bible. Romans chapter 11, look at verse 13. For I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office. If by any means I may provoke to emulation them that are my flesh, and might save some of them. For if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? For if the first fruit be holy, the lump, uh, the lump is also holy. And if the root be holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches be broken off, and thou being a wild olive tree wert grafted in among them, and with them partakest of the root and fatness of the olive tree, boast not against the branches. But if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. Thou wilt say then, the branches were broken off, that I might be grafted in. Well, because of unbelief they were broken off. And thou standest by faith. Be not high-minded, but fear. For if God spared not the natural branches, take heed, lest he also spare not thee. Behold the goodness and severity of God on them which fell severity, but towards thee goodness, if thou continue in his goodness. Otherwise, thou also shalt be cut off. So as we study the book of Ruth, we see the picture and and really we give glory to God and we praise the Lord and we thank the Lord for the goodness of God to the Gentiles. I am thankful that the Jews did what they did because I got to be grafted in as a result. And that's a wonderful thing. But he said, be not high minded. The opposite of high mindedness is but fear. The contrast is but fear fear. So if you get to the point where you don't fear God anymore, you can live however you want. You feel like, well, I'm saved, once saved, always saved, and blah, 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 that kind of argument, that kind of flippant attitude towards Christianity, the flippant attitude towards the Lord. Listen, it, you know, those Jews, you know, they reject it and they're blind and you get that high-minded attitude and you lose the fear of God, you're proud. So fear shows humility. Does that make sense? Look, when my kids get uh, 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 insolent face towards me, it it angers me. But when one of my kids recognizes that she's caught, little Ava's at that age now where she's realizing, oops. And when she when she's uh, she was sitting at the dinner table the other day and and she'd just gotten rebuked for something, and so she did something else, and then she stopped. And she looked right at me and she just stopped. And and it it was so cute because she was wondering if she was going to be in trouble. But the last time it was disobedience, this time it was an accident. I smiled and I said, it's okay. (laughs) She said, oh. You know, when that child shows that fear of dad, that invokes my pity. When they show that stubborn face and that I really don't care and I don't have any respect for you, that invokes my wrath. You know, we ought to have an attitude towards God of humility and of fear. Secondly, we ought to have an attitude towards God's people of humility and of fear. Because don't forget, Jesus Christ is coming back. And he's coming back to set up his kingdom in Israel. I don't care what they do with Palestine or whether or not they make Palestine a state and how hard Palestine tries to get Israel out of the land. Jesus Christ is their king. He's coming back and the Palestinians are going to lose. Amen. One piece of, can I just give you a little bit of good news? Can I just give you a little, and, and, in this very bad environment where all conservatives are just completely doom and gloom and all just ready for the end to come and the apocalypse to hit and we're looking for the beasts from hell to appear tomorrow in, in this horrible thing that Barack Obama got reelected and all that stuff. One good piece of news is the U.S. did stand with Israel. Oh, I said, I just said, thank you, Lord. I know we're doing a lot of things against her, but I'm just glad for that little piece. Amen. I'm glad for that little piece of hope. And I just said, maybe God's going to give us 10 or 15 more years. 
So let's not be high minded as we move through here, but fear. Now, that said, I want you to notice some things and I want to learn some things from this book. The first thing I want you to see in the book of Ruth is the bitterness that is created when a Christian or, a, or, a, or, a, or someone of God's people has the wrong priorities in their life. The wrong priorities. Look at verse 1. Now, it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land. There was a famine in the land. Now, listen to this. A certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to sojourn in the country of Moab. He, his wife, and his two sons. Bethlehem Judah means this. It means the house of bread and praise. That's where God's people were. It's where God was. But even though it was God's people, it was where they should have been, it was where they belonged, there still was a famine. Do you realize in your Christian life from time to time, in your marriage, in your family, in your church, you will go through spells and periods, just mark it down, I don't care who you are, how spiritual you are, how wonderful the preacher is, how straight the doctrine is, every church, every marriage, every family goes through periods of dryness. You go through periods of famine. You in your own personal Bible reading and prayer life will go through times when it's great and times when it's just not so great. And the wrong thing to do is make a move when the going is rough. Amen. I've had some opportunities. It's just been amazing to me how many opportunities have arisen this year. This year. And this, I've told you over and over again, this is the roughest year yet. Somebody offered to put my name into the hat for, for a church that's looking for a pastor, a large church in Texas that has plenty of money and a full-time position. And, you know, hey, they would love to have you. They've heard you preach. And they want, are you willing to? I said, not this year. I'll wait to make that decision when things are going great. Amen? And you know what? I made the right decision because this is exactly where God wants me to be and I'm staying. Hallelujah. So sorry about that if you're hoping I'd leave, but I'm not. Amen. I'm here to stay. But I'm just saying it's amazing how many opportunities present themselves when the going's rough. If you've got the wrong priorities in your life, you're going to wind up in a mess. The name of the man in verse number two was Elimelech. Elimelech's name it means my God is king. Now there's a problem though. Because Elimelech really meant, my money is king. How can you say that, preacher? Because when the famine came, guess what? Elimelech moved on. When things weren't as wealthy and prosperous in Bethlehem, Judah, that when things weren't as great over there, he went on down to Moab where, hey, I heard they got bread in Moab. I heard there's a good job down there. I'm going to go down there where I can just do a little better for my family because I don't want my family to have to live like this. And you know the, the thing, I mean, it's, it's like the most common statement in modern day America. I don't want my children to grow up like I did. You know what that means? I'm a great big baby and I never grew up, got over my childhood because my mommy and daddy told me no a couple times. So I'm not going to be an abusive parent like my mommy and daddy was, and I'm going to spoil my little brat so they will never appreciate anything. Amen. And so here he is saying, my God is king. But when the going gets rough, he's like, hey, I don't want to watch you guys be hungry. I don't want to teach you how to gracefully and powerfully with joy in the spirit of God make it through tough times. No, let's get out of here and go down to Moab where things are going better down there. Let's move where there's a better job. And that ain't the right decision. Because if my God was really king, I'd stay put where I'm at, whether it's good, whether it's bad, whether it's a famine, whether it's not, because I want to be where God is. I don't want to be where the money is. I want to be where God is. And Limelech's name means my God is king. Naomi's main name means pleasant. But you know, the truth is, she really meant I'm only pleasant when I'm spoiled. So I can kind of see the picture in my own mind of, of, of Elimelech over here, and he's all like, you know, man... Man, it's getting bad, man. We're losing my retirement. I worked my whole life to try to get here. I don't know what we're going to do. If it doesn't rain soon, I'm going to lose the whole crop. And, and I'm too old for this. I'm too old to be starting over again. I worked hard for what I got. I wasn't on welfare like the rest of them. And, oh, and the old wife was over there. Well, I just don't know. I shouldn't have to live like this. I went through this when I was younger. And I shouldn't have to do this all over again. I don't know what the problem is. And we need to go. We need to get down there with it. Did you hear how much money they got? Did you hear he got a new job? He's making more money than he used to. What's the matter with you, loser? And so before you know it, guess what? Pleasant, and my God is king, sell out to go where the money's at. Oops. 
You know what the Bible shows us here? It shows us they had the wrong priorities. It shows us when the road going got rough, they took off. Kind of reminds you of Laodicea, doesn't it? Money is king. Their job is their God. Look at verse number six. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the country of Moab, for as she had heard in the country of Moab how that God had visited his people in giving them bread. You know what she says? Oh, I heard they're doing better back home. I guess I'll go back now. You know what God, the Bible shows you? It shows you her hypocrisy. She's pleasant. She wasn't pleasant. She had it good before, and she was happy when she had it good, and when she didn't have it good anymore, she turned into a monster. He says, my God is king, but when he runs out of his money and God doesn't seem to be blessing him like he used to, he sells out and goes down to Moab, the world, place where God's people ought not be, for money. He had the wrong priorities. She had the wrong priorities, and their hypocrisy comes out. Everybody would have been looking at them and saying, oh, wow, they're such a spiritual couple. Oh, Elimelech. He just, God is the king of his life. He's a man of God. Isn't Naomi so sweet? She's so pleasant. She's so wonderful. Oh, I just love Naomi. But the real them was nothing of the kind. And their motives, their priorities began to show. You know, this happens in churches, folks. When the going gets rough, people leave. Pastor gets up and says, it's been a rough year. And, you know, broken hearted. And we're praying and we're asking. And it's amazing how... You know, somebody else comes up, well, we're leaving too, we're leaving too, we're leaving too. When the going gets rough and the people don't have the right priorities, they go. Let me tell you something. There's a hidden message in this text that most people miss. Bethlehem, Judah, meaning the house of bread or praise. You know where they should have stayed? They should have stayed in the house of bread and praise. You want to know why? That's talking about spiritual bread. Talking about praise to God. I I say this gently and and I say it from true experience. Never make your decisions based on a better job. I have moved from one state to the next state with no job. We made the decision to move. I left my wife in Illinois. I drove eight hours to Ohio because I had talked to some people. I had a little interview. The guy said, yeah, I'll hire you. For $10 an hour, I, we get like 25 to 35 hours a week. It's winter time. And I said, I'll take it. And there's no way I could pay my bills on it. No, I knew there was no way. I'd already signed a lease for, I think it was 800, almost 8, 750 a month. I had a $250 a month car payment. That right there is pretty much going to take up almost all my paycheck by the time you tithe and take out taxes. And you still got the cell phone bill, the car insurance, the lights, the phones, uh, whatever else, food. I knew I couldn't survive on the job I took and I had zero savings. I had my father-in-law had to fill up my last tank to get me there. How humiliating is that? But I made the decision based on a good local church where I knew my family would get fed spiritually. And I figured if I put God first, he'll take care of all the financial things in my life. And friends, he has. I've had, I could give you testimony after testimony after testimony of people who say, well, we love this church. We know this is where God put us. This is the greatest. Oh, praise the Lord for it. And then they need a job. They lose a job. And so it's like, well, we got an opening in another state. And I say, well, what about the church? What church are you going to? Well, you know, there's a few down there and I've been looking online and it says they're King James. And, you know, I know there's a few down there. and I got a friend who's going to a church and it's a good church. And, you know, we're going to listen. I know I'm not here to bash anybody. I'm not. I'm just trying to tell you, I don't think that's the right way to make your decision. I think you're putting the the, the cart before the horse instead of the horse before the cart. And it ends up in disaster that way. Oh, I think there's some good churches down there. I I believe that. And I think our church is a great church. I really do, or I wouldn't be here. Amen? I'm the pastor of the church. I think it's a great church. You looking for a good church? I know of one. Amen? Come on. Come join us. Be a part of it. But look, I don't also, at the same time, I'm not going to be so arrogant as to say it's God's will for every single good Christian to be in this church. If it was God's will for every Christian to be here, then where would the rest of the churches be? Does that make sense? Uh, Right? So you know what you got to do? you got to say, hey, God, where do you want me? You can't tell by Googling, you know, Baptist churches, King James Bible believing churches, Bible churches, whatever you want to Google. You can't tell by Google whether or not you're supposed to be there. Oh, God, 
lead me to this internet here and help me to know and, you know, bless this computer as I pray over the church you'd have me in. What is that? What kind of foolishness is that, man? You've got to put the church, the house of God first. You know, I, I mentioned this morning the first institution God created is the family. Amen? That's exactly right. And, and good churches are built on good families. I'm sorry, but good churches are not built on men's homes. It's where my heart's been. Young men, I want to see young men called to preach. Good churches aren't built on institutes. Good churches aren't built on Bible colleges. I mean, that's where my heart is. I'd like to see young men get called of God, get in the book, believe the Bible, go out, win souls, start churches. I would love to see that. But listen, God didn't call me necessarily at this point to do that. Right now, we're, we're getting the church going. We're trying to build a church. Jesus Christ said He's going to build the church. And guess where churches are built? They're built on good families. The family was first, the church was second. But that is not an excuse then to lay out of church. If you really love your family and you really believe it's the first institution God created and you really believe it's important, you will get your family in a local Bible-believing church every time the doors are open, every time it's humanly possible. You will be a part of that place so your family gets fed the Word of God, gets built up in the faith. You'll pray before you come. You'll say, God, give us the message. Get a hold of that preacher. Give him the scripture we need and get us, God, so we can live for you and serve you and praise you and grow in you. You see, they had the wrong priorities. They were in Bethlehem, Judah. That's where they lived. And they seemed to be committed to it. They seemed to be a serious part of it. But listen, they really weren't. Because when the going got rough, got rough, they made their decision based on economy. They made their decision based on a job. And I'm just telling you, I've seen that be a massive mistake. And I've seen it work the other way. Where people have packed up and moved across states to be in a church they knew God wanted them in. And I've seen God bless them every single time. Friend, make sure your priorities are right. Notice the second thing. Look at the bitterness of wrong counsel in this text. Wherefore, she went forth out of that place where she was, verse number 7, and her two daughter in, daughters-in-law with her, and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. And Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each to her mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you, as ye have dealt with the dead and with me. So here's Naomi Pleasant, and, and she goes down to the land of Moab, and her husband dies. Well, that's what happens when you set the wrong priorities. I'm not saying a physical death, but there definitely will be a spiritual death. Now her husband's no longer the man that he used to be. Look, you can chase the dollar bill, you can chase the good economy, you can chase a better job, but if you're not putting God and His Word first, it doesn't really matter if you do catch it. It's death. What good's it do for your husband to be rich and to make it good and make your life happy if you lose him spiritually? And then, not only that, but now her two sons die. Nalon, I think his name, uh, I don't remember Shilion, it means, it means, uh, um, small. It means weak. Let me look at it. I had it memorized, but I'm getting old. Hold on a second. Yeah, it means small, weak, and pining. And Malon means sick. So she goes down there, she winds up down there in Moab in the world, and she loses her husband, and then she loses her two sons. I don't know what price I would pay to have my daughters grow up and serve Jesus Christ. I don't know, I don't know, I don't know what price I'd pay. I don't know how far I'd go to see my children strong in the Lord in the power of His might. And how she lost her family. So trying to save them, well, i got to feed my kids. Well, honey, we got to survive. What about our security? What about your job? we got to survive. What are we going to do? Okay, go down to Moab. She lost them all. A lot of good it did. Don't you think it would have been better to put God first and let Him figure the rest out? Amen. You know, sometimes, folks, we strategize too much. <laughs> and we wind up messing ourselves up. Trust God. So here she is now as she's heading back with her daughters-in-law in in verse number 7. And that's all she's got left is her daughters-in-law. And she's going back. And now here this woman is giving counsel to these young girls. That is just unbelievably strange counsel coming from a woman who knows God quite well. Who was a leader in the church. Who was somebody that was recognized. And now here the mother-in-law is talking to her daughters-in-law and giving them advice. Can I just say this for a minute? Be real careful who you take advice from. 
You might say, well, you know, Naomi, everybody knows Naomi, and Naomi's a good woman, and she's been at this a long time, and she's been serving the Lord forever, and you know, she's got a lot of wisdom, and you know who Elimelech was? Elimelech, oh, you know, everybody knows Elimelech, and oh, do you know what happened to the boys? That's so sad what happened to the boys. Oh, well, you know, it could happen to anybody. And here she is walking and talking with these girls, but you know what she's telling them to do? Can I just translate it for you? When you put it in the Greek? It means, girls, go to hell. Go to hell. But Naomi, you're our mother-in-law. But Naomi, we're going to stay with you. Okay, no, girls, go to hell. That's what it essentially means. Because she said, go back. And then she said, she returned to her gods. She said, go back to your gods. You see that in the text as we read it? What in the world would she say something like that for? She knew the true God. She didn't care about her daughter-in-laws. Not even a little bit. But what an evil heart. What a wicked heart. Why wouldn't that woman want her daughter-in-law in the place where she could get the blessing of God too? Why wouldn't she want her daughter-in-law in the church, serving God, doing well? Why would she tell her something like that? Be careful when you get the wrong priorities because you'll wind up being the one coming in the way of lost souls, coming to Christ and doing extensive, continual damage to your family. And there she is saying, go to hell. And they're saying, Naomi, we're going with you, man. You know, you know, being an older woman or an older man is an awesome responsibility. I said, you know, from years of preaching, younger folks, we've gotten some things backwards, to be honest with you, without realizing it. We've heard, honor, uh, respect your elders, you know, honor your father and mother, right? Well, do you realize once you become an adult and you're married and you're two, you're a young couple under God and you've left to cleave, that it's now you and God? And honor is something somebody earns? She said, well, I'm supposed to honor my elders and respect my elders and my elder told me to do this and told me to do that. Well, if they're giving you wicked counsel, why are you listening? You're going to answer to God directly because you might be 20 years old, you might be 30 years old, but when you step out from under their authority and you get married and that becomes an institution between you and God, guess what? You're answering to God for your decisions and there ain't going to be no what my mommy said, but my daddy said, but my mother-in-law, but my father-in-law, but my blah, blah, blah. None of that, man. It's you and God. And one of the daughters, unfortunately, listens. Watch this about advice. Go back with me, if you would, to 1 Kings chapter 13. Uh, actually, forward. I said back, but it's forward. 1 Kings chapter 13. Be careful about what advice you get. You know, it seems, it's funny to me because everybody seems to be, everybody seems to be a, a, uh, a professional. On child rearing. You ever notice that? And some of you listen to people you got no business listening to. You're actually doing a better job than they are, although they look like they're doing a great job to the world, but you're doing a better job than they are. And you let them, you know, get in your ear and influence you. What's the matter with you? Get a hold of God. And listen to the people God put in your life you know God put in your life. And watch out for every little, you know, Yahoo that wants to come by and give you some advice. Amen. First Corinthians 13, look at verse 11. Now there dwelt an old prophet in Bethel. And his sons came and told him all the works that the man of God had done that day in Bethel. Now what do you want to be? The old prophet or a man of God? Now I was thinking today when we were in that office praying before church, we got a bunch of young men in here. And it's exciting to me. And that's not to discredit the older men that God puts here. I mean, not even a little bit. Not even a little bit. But you want to know, I get excited about some young men that just are serious about serving God. See, it makes sense to me that an older man does. Because he's been around long enough to know that life ain't no good. And that all he's got is God. Amen? He's experienced enough. But a young man who still feels strong in his flesh and still ready to move forward and take the world on, but will sell himself out to God is a blessing. Amen? Now, that's what you've got here. And in verse number 11, the words which he had spoken unto the king, them, all, them they told also to their father. And their father said unto them, what way went he? For his sons had seen what way the man of God went, which came from Judah. And he said unto his sons, saddle me the ass. So they saddled him the ass, and he rode thereon. And went after the man of God, and found him sitting under an oak. And he said unto him, art thou the man of God that camest from Judah? And he said, I am. 
First mistake. You see what it is? What mistake did he make? He's proud. Do you see it? I am. Who's the I am? There's only one I am. And he should have known that. He should have read Exodus. I am that I am has sent thee. There's pride there. And he said unto him, Come with me and eat bread. And he said, I may not return with thee, nor go with thee, neither will I eat bread nor drink water with thee in this place. For it said to me by the word of the Lord, Thou shalt eat no bread nor drink water there, nor turn again to go by the way that thou camest. And he said unto him, I am a prophet also as thou art. Well, so stinking what? I'm a preacher too. I don't care if you're a preacher. Go knock yourself out. Here's a soapbox. There's a corner right up there. Have fun. I'm going home. Why? Because I already heard from God. What do I care what you think? That would have been the right answer, right? Well, brother, do you know who I am? Nope. <laughs> I mean, I literally, you go to these, these meetings and I literally have to Hi, Brother Reagan, do you know who I am? Nope. I'm, I'm just like, nice to meet you. <laughs> Try not to laugh. Who cares? It's not about you and it's not about me. It's about the Word of God. Amen? Now watch. Um, verse 18. I'm a prophet also as thou art. And an angel spake unto me by the word of the Lord. So what? That should have been the right answer. I already heard from the Bible. I don't care if an angel showed up to you by the word of the Lord. I heard from the book. You had it, you know, an angel from an angel Bible you. I got like me and Bible. There's no angel between me and the Bible. I got the Bible and the Spirit's in me. I got it. I'm good. I don't care if an angel showed up to you. I don't care if you're a preacher. I don't care who you are. I already know what God said. So don't ask me to do something God told me not to do. Right? It's just that easy. But not for this guy. Saying, bring him back with thee into thine house, that he may eat bread and drink water. But he lied unto him. You know what? Sometimes we get too super spiritual, folks. The devil will get you by your pride. He will get you by your super spirituality. Are you trying to encourage people not to be spiritual? Of course not. But when you get righteous over much, the book of Ecclesiastes said, you are in for a kill. Don't get too super spiritual. Nose in the air, you know, an angel. Oh, I got it. Fast. God's done things with me he's never done with anybody else. I, you know, we praise God for what God's done in this church. Amen. Amen. But I could give you a list of guys who are really blowing us out of the water from a worldly perspective. That's really good for me to see every once in a while. Amen. Oh, I'm just so discouraged. God's not blessing me as much as them. Good. You're growing up. Amen. Look at verse 19. So he went back with him and did eat bread in his house and drank water. And it came to pass that they sat at the table that the word of the Lord came unto the prophet that brought him back. And he cried unto the man of God that came from Judah, saying, Thus saith the Lord, for as much as thou hast disobeyed the mouth of the Lord, and hast not kept the commandment which the Lord thy God commanded thee, but camest back, and hast eaten bread and drunk water in this place, of which the Lord did say to thee, Eat no bread and drink no water, thy carcass shall not come into the sepulcher of thy fathers. He cried. He was preaching. The smooth, slick words and the pumping up of his pride was gone. And now he's just let him have it. Well, that's how you know you're getting it straight from God. He ain't worried about appealing to your flesh. He's going to give it right at you, I mean, 90 miles an hour. And he's preaching to him. It came to pass after he had beaten bread and after he had drunk that he saddled for him the ass to wit for the prophet who had brought him back. And when he was gone, a lion met him by the way and slew him. And his carcass was cast in the way and the ass stood by it and the lion also stood by the carcass. And behold, men passed by and saw the carcass cast in the way, the lion standing by the carcass, and they came and told him the city where the old prophet dwelt. And when the prophet that brought him back from the way heard thereof, he said, It is the man of God who is disobedient unto the word of the Lord. <laughs> what a mess. Look at how this thing ends up. Verse number 30. And he laid his carcass in his own grave. And they mourned over him, saying, Alas, my brother. The old prophet goes back to that young prophet. Takes that young prophet down. Lays that young prophet in his own grave. And says, Oh, I can't believe this happened. How could this happen? I'll tell you how it happened. It happened because somebody who looks like they're spiritual is not always spiritual. And somebody who may appear to be a prophet and been around a lot longer than you will come up to you and appeal to your pride. 
That's why it says not a novice was being lifted up with pride. Boy, it's a blessing to find a young preacher who can come and say, uh, something's real wrong with this certain situation. Um, I don't like how nice they're being. <laughs> I mean, man, that shows you that guy's got some wisdom. God's given him some discernment. He's got the right heart. But most young people don't get it. They'll come and they'll pump up your pride just a little bit and kill you, taking the wrong advice. And while you deny the word of God, thinking you're doing something spiritual, not noticing your own pride, you can get led astray. We have got we've got a, a thing in our culture where the preachers, especially the older preachers, have been lifted up so much that if he came to some of you and said, you should be over here and you shouldn't be there, you'd start double guessing and, and getting all nervous and unstable. And, did I do the right thing? Did I didn't? Did I not do the right thing? Should I? You got to get a hold of that book. You got to know where that book stands. You got to know what God's saying to you from that Bible and putting the Bible first in your life. Everything else takes care of itself. You know what Ruth did? She said, nothing doing, old lady. Nothing doing. Notice the bitterness of wrong counsel, the bitterness of improper priorities. But look lastly at the blessing of a steadfast mind. The blessing of a steadfast mind. Look at verse 14. And they lifted up their voice and wept again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law. Oh, you know, you know, you know, cleaving's a lot better than kissing. But Ruth clave under her. That's what the verse says. We just love you and we just love this church and we just, it just breaks our heart to leave. It just... Don't kiss the next preacher and he'll believe you. I'm not believing it. Just love you so much. I know. You know what? Cleave. Amen. I'm not saying don't be complimentary. Some of you have said that and you don't know how much you've encouraged my heart. And I love you too. I mean it. I love my wife to death and I tell her I love her. But I don't just tell her I love her. I stick with her. Amen. I don't want to hear, honey, I love you, but I'm leaving. Great. What good is your loving me doing? You know, go. You know, what am I going to do? I don't know. I'd be probably, I act all tough, you know. I'd be like, oh, I'm going to kill myself. My life would be over. But I'd play tough in the meanwhile, just so she knows I'm tough. Cleveland's better than kissing, amen? See, the one is, is acting all emotional, and the mother in law is acting all emotional, and there's just, oh, I hate to see you go. I love you, and I love you. I just love you, and I just, oh, I wish I could have another son for you to marry you, but not really meaning it. But Ruth is different. You see, Ruth was not critical in her spirit. Look, look at verse 15. And she said, Behold, thy sister in law has gone back unto her people, and unto her gods. Return thou after thy sister-in-law. Okay, Ruth, your sister-in-law has gone to hell. She's made the wrong decision. She's gone back to her people. We shouldn't have been here anyways. You've got no business being my daughter-in-law. You see what a dirtbag you are? I'm a Jew. You're a dirtbag, and I don't want you coming back with me making me look bad. You're making me look bad, Ruth. She left. You leave. I mean, pressure, 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 pressure against her to get her to do the wrong thing. That is how the devil will work in your life. But you know what Ruth did? She didn't have a critical spirit. Ruth could have just absolutely blasted that bag. I mean, she could have just let her have it. But she didn't. You know what Ruth did? Look at verse, uh, what's that, verse uh, 16. And Ruth said, entreat me not to leave thee, or to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I'll go. And where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God, my God. Where thou diest will I die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught but death part me and thee. You want to know why I think Ruth had such a good spirit? She didn't get critical. When somebody else hurts you, if you go back at them, you will become just like them. You know why Ruth could hold it together? Because Ruth had one focus, and that focus was thy God is going to be my God. She said, Naomi, you might not be the most pleasant thing I've ever met, but I know one thing about where you came from. That's the house of bread and praise. And I know those gods and those people, they're nothing. And I saw what you guys were when you got here. I saw what has happened to you. And I know where you're going. And I'm going where you're going because I want to be what God is. You see, when the focus is on God... 
when the focus is on serving the Lord and on following the Lord, everything else will work itself out in your life. Everything else. Look, verse 17, uh, verse uh, 18, when she saw she was steadfastly minded to go with her. You know what the Bible tells you in James 1.8? Not to be double-minded. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Ruth, think about the what-ifs Ruth could have come up with. Okay, I'm going to a totally new land. These people are totally different. Thankfully, and and I'm pretty sure that the book of Ruth falls right around, right shortly after the victory of Deborah and Barak. Because the nation had been judged, God came in and blessed them, gave them some victory all through the book of Judges. Ruth actually, uh, the, the chronology of Ruth is during the period of the Judges, okay? And so Ruth probably falls in shortly after the victory of Deborah and Barak. So they heard about God blessing his people again, and now they're heading back. And so Ruth is going to a whole new land. It's a place where a war just happened. It's a place that was in famine and now is getting better. And you know, it seems like it's all good. I mean, you know, it's okay right now. But what if the economy tanks later? What if I get there and I'm the Moabite woman? I'm the, I'm the Gentile woman. I'm the dirty woman. These are clean Jews. I mean, they got these laws they live by. And they got all these rules and restrictions. And, and I mean, they, they circumcise their child on a certain day. And there's some foods they won't eat and other foods they will eat. And, and they wash a certain way. And they have certain sacrifices done a certain way. I don't know what they do and how they do it all. What if they don't accept me? I'm a dirty Gentile. Think about all the what ifs that Ruth could have come up with. Well, what if I get there and Naomi won't have anything to do with me and I become homeless? What if I get there and the people don't want me there and they kick me out? See, Ruth wasn't double-minded. She wasn't looking at what if it fails. She just said, I want God and I'm going to go where God is. And if i got to be a servant and a slave in the land where God is, I'd rather be a slave in the land of God, a doorkeeper in the house of my God, than to dwell in the tents of the wicked. She had her mind made up that God was her goal and nothing was going to stop her. And she said, Naomi, entreat me not to leave thee. Knock it off. Leave me alone. I'm going. And where you die, I'm going to die. She had her mind made up. She was serving God no matter what. And boy, this story gets good because God takes real good care of this girl. He cares a lot about her. God actually works through luck. And I'll show you that in a couple of weeks. She had a goal to serve the Lord that she wasn't backing off for. And at the end of that chapter, look down there at verse number 22. They came to Bethlehem in the beginning of barley harvest. What she didn't know is God had everything set up just right for her. She, Ruth, stepped out in faith to follow God, to put the house of bread and praise first, to make God first in her life, to go where God's people were. She turned her back on her family. She turned her back on all she'd known, on her childhood, on all her memories, and abandoned all of it to follow God. She even threw away her pride. Here she was, second to Naomi. And when, when she comes back into town, everybody's going, Is this Naomi? Is this Naomi? Is this Naomi? No mention of, hey, who's that nice young lady with you? Oh, she's so pretty. She's such a sweet spirit about her. Ruth had to have a sweet spirit about her. And Boaz, because she caught Boaz's eye. She must have been attractive. No mention of any of that. And Naomi sure didn't seem to look at her that way. Naomi seemed to be pretty critical of her. Just go. Go to hell. I don't care. Leave me alone. Go back. And they're saying, is this Naomi? All the attention is on Naomi. And Ruth is overlooked. Except for one thing. God was watching her. You might feel overlooked, but if you're doing right, God's watching you. So just bide your time. Just bide your time. It'll be all right. And it all turns out great for Ruth. Not so much for Naomi. She comes back here and they call her Naomi and she says, Hey, don't call me Naomi. Call me Mara from bitter. And the Lord has dealt bitterly with me. Oh, he hadn't done nothing to her. She made her own bed. And she's mad at God because she reaped what she sowed. I, I wonder two things. I wonder if it's possible that she just nagged her husband until he went. And so God said, okay, you go back alone. And she lived her life out a miserable woman. Or I wonder if it's possible that he was this money-hungry idiot trying to drive his family to success. And so God gave her pity and brought her back. And she suffered because of her idiot husband. But God brought her back and then gave her some life left because... She was just following the old man. 
But it could play out and preach either way. Amen. But the focus here, I want to be on Ruth. She shows up at the beginning of barley harvest. Let's, let's go to a couple passages of scriptures and then we'll close. Go with me to Luke chapter number 10. You see, I believe with all my heart, we got a church of people who wants God to use them. I'd be willing to bet, and I won't ask for hands, but I'd be willing to bet most of you in this room have handed somebody a track this week, right? A gospel track? Right? <laughs> some of you are like, can I have some of you like, oh, oh, I hate it when he does that. Amen. I hate it when I do it too. Amen. So we're in the same boat. But I bet you most of you have tried. I bet you when I preach about uh, every one of you, there's no excuse. Every one of you ought to be able to win at least one person to Jesus Christ this year. Some of you sit there and go, yeah. Yeah, I wish I could. Yeah, I'm going to try. Yeah, I'm gonna try. man, I've been trying. I've been inviting people. But man, I've tried here and I've tried there and I've failed here and I've failed there. And it's just, man, yeah, but he's right. I should be able to. And you go out and make some kind of an effort, right? All right, look at Luke chapter 10, verse 2. Therefore said he unto them, The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Ooh, I don't like this passage of Scripture is convicting, amen? How many young men have gotten called to preach or gotten a big burden to do something for God and just took off on this verse? Because some preacher got up, now before you respond, listen, study it out with me. Some preacher got up and preached, Harvest is great. The labors are few. We need more preachers. We need more preachers. You ought to preach. You shouldn't sit there getting fed, enjoying getting fat in the house of God. You need to get out there and feed somebody. And you feel like, oh, I'm a fat Christian because this has really been good and I've been getting fed and I'm learning a lot of Bible. And, oh, I don't want to be one of those fat Christians. I'm going to go serve God. The harvest is great. The world's going to hell. i got to get out there. Right? Read the rest of the verse. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. Where is all the focus? Pray the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. The focus is not the laborers. The focus is the Lord. It is his harvest harvest. When Ruth showed up, she wasn't right out in the field. The barley harvest was beginning. God's timing had been right. He'd been working. He'd been setting the stage. I'll show you what I'm talking about. Go back to Exodus chapter 18. This is my concluding point, so relax. We're getting out of here. Amen. Exodus chapter 18. Should the Lord let us go, He might keep us a couple more hours. I can't tell. Exodus chapter 18, look at verse 13. And it came to pass on the morrow that Moses sat to judge the people. And the people stood by Moses from the morning unto the evening. Now, wait a minute. That's kind of pathetic. Really. Seriously. Common sense tells you these people got to work. They got somewhere to go. They need to hear from God. And that's a ridiculously long line. Amen. When I go to vote, I want to be in and out. Up the road, on with my day, amen. Don't make me wait in a long line. You guys heard all about it that on the news, and we're sorry. We'll try to expedite things in the future, blah, blah, blah. Now watch. But Moses' father-in-law, wait a minute. The mother-in-law in the last passage was given some bad advice. Now here's the old man comes along, Moses' father-in-law. Saw all that he did to the people. He said, what is this thing that thou doest to the people? Why sittest thou thyself alone, and all the people stand by thee from morning unto evening? Moses said unto his father-in-law, Because the people come unto me to inquire of God. And when they have a matter, they come unto me, and I judge between one and the other, and I do make them know the statutes of God and his laws. And Moses' father-in-law said unto him, The thing that thou doest is not good. Thou wilt surely wear away both thou and this people that is with thee, for this thing is too heavy for thee. Thou art not able to perform it thyself alone. Hearken now unto my voice. I will give thee counsel, and God shall be with thee. But be thou for the people to Godward, that thou mayest bring the causes unto God. And thou shalt teach them ordinances and laws, and shalt show them the way wherein they must walk, and the work that they must do. Moreover, thou shalt provide out of all the people able men, such as fear God, men of truth, 
hating covetousness, and place such over them to be rulers of thousands and hundreds and rulers of fifties and rulers of tens. And let them judge the people at all seasons. And it shall be that every great matter they shall bring unto thee, but every small matter they shall judge. So shall it be easier for thyself, and they shall bear the burden with thee. If thou shalt do this thing, and God command thee so, then thou shalt be able to endure, and all this people shall also go to their place in peace. Now, is that common sense? Sound like a good plan? Did you follow the reading? Moses is sitting there all day long. People are coming. He's going, man, Moses, you're going to wear out, dude. You can't keep this up forever. And number two, these people are going to wear out. Now, your counselors will always get very spiritual because they know you're spiritual. They know you want the truth. So they will get very spiritual. And they always invoke the authority of God for their opinion. It's crazy, man. Well, the Lord told me. Well, the Lord showed me. The Lord showed me you need to. I have come to the point now where I say, well, you go back to God and you tell God to tell me and then I'll do it. Well, the Lord showed me you need to. Really? He did? <laughs> that's good. Man, I have a hard enough time finding out what God wants me to do alone, let alone Him telling you to tell me. I mean, that's great. You're something else. They always invoke the authority of God. Now, what is wrong with what He said? You got any problems with it? It sounds like solid advice, doesn't it? It looks like the right advice. The harvest is great! Go! 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 But wait a minute. God didn't tell Moses to do that. And the devil knew Moses' weakness. Because from the get-go, Moses said, God, I can't. I can't. God said, yes, I can't. Yes, I can't. Yes, I can't. I'm not able. I have speech, but I can't do, do, do what you want me to do, do. Moses, you're going. So, so finally God says, okay, fine. I'll send Aaron with you. He'll be to you a mouth. You'll be to him as God, and I'll go. So Moses went. Aaron wasn't God's pick. Moses was God's pick. Now, the father-in-law gives Moses some advice. He kind of hits Moses where he's weak because the devil knows wherever you're weak. And in a spiritual way, in a practical way, in a way to help other people. What are you doing to them? That's what he said. What are you doing to these people? What are you doing? What do you mean? What am I doing? I'm not trying to hurt it. Moses had a good heart. I'm not trying to... No, what was? What did I do? I, uh, yeah, you're right. Oh my goodness, look what I'm doing. You're right, I can't do this. Yeah, I am wearing out. Yeah, I've been biting the kid's head off lately. And yeah, that's just the problem. This has to be fixed. Here's a solution. So Moses hearkened unto his father-in-law, not unto God. And Moses chose able-bodied men, and he did it. Fast forward with me to Exodus chapter 32. Verse 19. And it came to pass, as soon as he came up into the camp, he saw the calf and the dancing, and Moses' anger waxed hot. He cast the table out of his hands and broke them beneath the mount. You know what's going on here? While Moses is up there hearing from God, I think Joshua is with him. They go down there. They influence Moses to make a calf. They're worshiping. They're dancing. They're committing all kinds of fornication and wickedness and sin, worshiping idols, worshiping the devil. While Moses is up there in the mountain, they're at the foot of the mountain worshiping the devil. You know who that is? Those are Moses' pick. The man God picked was in the mountain with God. The man God sent with Moses because he wouldn't quit whining and, and, and didn't trust God it was the man that was down there leading those people. Death came as a result. And all those able-bodied men who loved God and hate covetousness and love the truth and blah, blah, blah were down there leading God's people into wicked, abominable sin that brought the wrath of God. So the right thing at the wrong time can be the wrong thing. And the devil will mess you up and get you thinking it's different. To ruin you and he'll use you. He'll let you build a little bit of a church and then ruin that church if it ain't God's timing. How many preachers have turned out to be a horrible testimony and hurt more people than they've helped? Under the name of God being called to preach. And God said, I never put my word in your mouth and I never sent you. Oops. He's supposed to send forth the laborers when he's ready. Numbers chapter 11. This is the last one. Numbers chapter 11, look at verse 16. And the Lord said unto Moses, Gather unto me seventy men of the elders of Israel, whom thou knowest to be the elders of the people, 
and officers over them. And bring them under the tabernacle of the congregation that they may stand there with thee. And I will come down and talk with thee there. And I will take of the spirit which is upon thee. You see the small s? We talked about it this morning, the spirit of a man. Paul in that local church said, my spirit and with the power of the Lord. So God does use men. And I will take of thy spirit which is upon thee and I will put it upon them. And they shall bear the burden of the people with thee that thou bear it not thyself alone. It's been a year since Moses obeyed his father-in-law and did it himself. A year later, Moses obeys God, and God takes his spirit, God puts his spirit on 70 of those men, and God blesses that thing, and God uses those men to help the nation, to help Moses, and to get it done for God. There was a need a year ago, but it wasn't God's timing. Isn't that wild? So we preach, go, the harvest is great, go, 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 but that's not how God works. God will wait. God knows the harvest is needed. God knows there's laborers that got to go. But God is working on you. And God will have you ready when God is your focus. God has Ruth ready, but it was God that was her focus. She wasn't saying, I'm going to go make a new life for myself. I'm going to get in those fields. I'm going to help you out, Naomi. I'm going down there. I'm going to serve God. The job needs to be done, and I'm going to get it done. I'm going to take care of you, Naomi. And yay, wait and see what Lydia's eye lined up in, Naomi. It was all about God for Ruth. And then, when it was all about God for her, she was willing to take second place to Naomi. She was willing to be scorned. She was willing to get out of those fields and just be one of the servant girls, one of the paupers, one of the, one of the weak people of the nation, one of the Gentiles among the special people. But boy, when she had God as her focus, and that's all she cared about, he put her in his field at the beginning of harvest. God said, separate into me Paul and Barnabas for the work we're into. I have called them. You see, friend, when you put God first in your life, the house of bread and praise first in your life, God will grow you, develop you, strengthen you, prepare you, work in you. And then when He's ready, what will just automatically happen? God will set up your circumstances. God will set up your path. God will guide your feet and you will wind up in the will of God. Whether you're called to preach, whether you're called to a mission field halfway around the world, you've never even heard of yet and don't have any idea how to get there. God will set up your path and it will happen and you'll know it's God. But he wants to be first, first. So the preaching, the harvest is great, go, 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 is stupid. And the preaching ought to be, sit down and wait. Sit down and wait. Let God work in you. Love Him. Learn His book. Grow in Him. Pray and labor where you are. God will direct your path. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you so much for the common sense truths in the Bible. Help us, Lord, to be like Ruth. Help us to put God first. Help us to faithfully labor where we are. Father, there's some people in this room that love you, and I know that. People that want to serve you. And just talking with them young men Friday night at my house, Lord, and some of them are really feeling that maybe God's calling them to preach or to the mission field or for something like that. God, they're supposed to be here this afternoon, and they weren't. I pray that the devil would just get out of the way and that, Father, you would just uh, draw them along and strengthen them and get them in the book and prepare them. Father, I pray that this church would become a place where people can get some bread from God and some praise of God and that we would become a church maybe someday, Lord, that sends them out. Lord, that you come along and look at your field and say, all right, that one's ready, I'm taking him, and just send them out, Lord, and strengthen them and develop them. Father, even if that doesn't happen, I pray this place would be the house of bread and praise for us. Those who live here locally and are staying the rest of their life by the grace of God, I pray that you'd help us to truly get some bread from heaven here in this church. Help us to put God first, have the right priorities, listen to the right counsel, and to have the blessedness of a steadfast mind in serving Christ. pray these things in Jesus' name and for His sake. Amen.